up that way anyway. I thought I would do some visiting. So, um, today I was planning to talk about morphogenic fields. Um, I have been working with that book by Raven Gramasi, um, called The, uh, The Cauldron of Memory. Um, many of us who practice witchcraft know about, um, uh, shadow um, shadow gardening or shadow memory um, I think I did a video um, quite a while ago a couple years ago on um, shadow gardening which um, in my old home was something that I practiced um, on a regular basis basically the idea is um, that when you do a certain type of spell work, especially like protection or something for prosperity or um, uh, anything really good that you want to continue to have in your life, um, and you use a particular spell form, um, whatever herbs that you use, you will then replace um, the ashes from that spell or the remnants. You'll put it in your shadow garden and then you will replant the following year um, the same herbs. And the idea is that in that those ashes of those herbs um, and those ingredients, oils, whatever, just as long as it's nothing um, non-biodegradable, um, the idea is that now the earth will hold that memory, that energy um, remnant. And so when the new plants grow the following year, they already have the memory of how they worked and they already have that memory in it in them of how um, how to gain the power and, and do the spells for prosperity or whatever um, all these positive things so that the next generation of those plants are going to be that much more um, in tune and that much more powerful when you use them um, for example you know, you play the piano for the first time, you're not going to be good. But if you have a memory of how to read music, you're going to be that much better. And if you, your whole family has been um, generation after generation of amazing pianists, you're going to be like an amazing pianist, most likely. Um, it's the same idea. So, um, and this goes further. Science has been... Um, investigating this whole topic as far as um, our DNA goes. Um, previously, when DNA was discovered, they thought, you know, there's these three strands of DNA, and basically two of them are just junk DNA that have nothing to do with, you know, um, what you're going to be like or what your body's going to do or what diseases you're going to get. There's one um, DNA strand that they figured out and that they figured this is the one that's important and the other two are nothing they're just junk you know extras but now what they found out <laughs> or what um I don't think it's been like a hundred percent proven but basically the theory is that <clears throat> within your DNA are all these memories of all the generations back that we have access to we just have to like um for example if you if you carry um the gene for cancer it doesn't mean you're going to get cancer but if you do all these things to expose yourself to certain environments that are um cancer provoking then the chances that you're going to get cancer are much more likely if you chain smoke if you drink if you do all kinds of toxic um, things in a toxic environment, you're going to invoke that cancer gene. You're going to activate it. And it's the same idea with these memories that they believe are stored in our genetics. So, um, and I know there's other uh, studies done on animals, like um, there's certain environmental factors that can cause an animal's um, fur to change color. Like um, in the winter, rabbit's hair can turn white, so they blend in with the snow, and then in, they shed the white um, fur when all the greenery comes out, and then they turn brown. 
Um, but that's a genetic factor for a purpose, and that is stored within the genetic memory because the first rabbits who didn't turn white and didn't activate that from the cold weather um, died. They were easily spotted by the predators, and they were eaten. So um, within our genetics are the same kind of things. And um, <clears throat> they're doing a study right now on the children, the, the children of... Um, pregnant women from 9-11, people who experienced 9-11, either they were pregnant and they were a part, they were in one of the buildings and survived, or they, um, you know, somehow the trauma affected their lives directly. Um, and what they have found is that um, if the woman was beyond the third month of pregnancy, yes, the trauma, the, um, the hormones of that traumatic event triggered something within the child that this child, when they're born, are going to have a higher anxiety, a higher stress um, response. They're going to be more stressed out from less stimulus. Um, and so this, <clears throat> this idea also was tested going back in history. Um, to, I believe, like the 1800s, um, they studied people who had been involved in famines, people who had been involved in, um, <clears throat> like the Great Depression, and when they had, like, um, you know, no money, no food, hor a horrible catastrophe befell their family, and what they found is that it was not the, um, the first generation, but the next generation, the, if the people were pregnant beyond, um, third month, and this catastrophe befell them, they were able to um, trace the genetics and figure out what symptoms or what things that these people suffered from. And it showed that um, in people who went through famine, those people tended to be overeaters and um, they were obese. They had problems with eating too much because whatever genetic um, code was in their DNA, it was triggered by um, that memory of a famine and that you better eat and you better get some fat to yourself or else you'll die. So I just think that's really cool. Um, I believe the study is called, uh, I don't know what the actual study is called, but the field of study is morphogenics. And I think it's awesome because all these things that witches have for thousands of years been able to tap into and instinctually knew about um, that certain ritual um, things that we can do to invoke something within us is the truth. We're invoking, we're um, working with the ancestors um, is not necessarily like some hoodoo, weird, you know, um, what do they call it? Hocus pocus. It's, it's not like that. We're, we're doing activities or we're using certain methods that allow something within us to be activated that we all have. And I think that's amazing. Um, so in this sense, it means that reincarnation might not be exactly what we thought. You know, us having past life recall may just be that we're activating something within our DNA, our genetic makeup, um, certain environmental factors, certain things we do, certain moods we get in, <clears throat> states of mind, are accessing those memories of people who we carry their blood. Um, I don't know if I believe necessarily that, you know, our specific um, soul, our specific person, is um, living over and over again, but we do have access. I'm absolutely sure we have access to something within us. Um, and so the idea was, um, they went into some details about birds and other species of animals and how important this is. Um, like how when um, certain types of birds hatched, that um, they are prey for hawks. And so they did these studies. When the birds were born, they had not been exposed to anything yet. And they would put a shadow, a shadow of a bird flying over. If it was a hawk, the birds would cower and they would try to hide. 
but if it was, you know, um, a different species of bird, it didn't matter if it was the same size as a hawk, but somehow, instinctually, the birds knew hawk means danger, other birds don't. <laughs> and, you know, scientists are wondering, how do they know? They haven't seen anything yet, they haven't been exposed to anything, their mothers hadn't taught them. But um, there's something within them that is some kind of genetic memory that they just know. Um, similar with uh, turtles, little baby turtles when they first hatch, they come out of the eggs and even if they're turned around, made dizzy, they've <laughs> done all kinds of things to try to confuse these poor little baby turtles. They know which direction the water is. They just know. They know and not only do they know which direction to go when they hatch, they know that they have to get there quickly because the ones that don't get there quickly enough are scooped up and eaten by um, seagulls and other you know, predatory animals that eat turtles. So I just thought I would share some of that with those of you who haven't um, read too much about it. Um, there's also, I have this book with me, um, it's The God Code. Um, some of you might be interested in it, some of you might not. Um, it's interesting, it's not about the morphogenics exactly. Um, there's some some degree of um, stuff about that, but um, I don't think they actually even call it morphogenics in this book. It's more oriented towards the fact that um, the DNA has some kind of um, name within it, like the name of the creator is in our DNA and it's also in the DNA of all living creatures. And when they first discovered DNA, they didn't know this, but over time they've kind of um, realized that our DNA is very similar to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, which we all know that 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet also correlate with um, the major um, arcana of the tarot. Um, there's theories that the tarot is actually um, this information Basically, it's, you know, similar to what's in the Bible in um, visual form that the messages from our Creator are within the tarot. And it's also within our DNA because if the name of God is the Bible, because it says in the Bible that the Word of God is God, it was with God, it is God. Um, I'm not quoting scripture. Um, I forget exactly. It's, it's something like in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, so if this idea that <clears throat> these words are also the very essence of the Creator, um, these pictures also are the essence of the Creator, the letters are the essence of the Creator, our blood is the essence of the Creator. Basically, um, it correlates with the idea that we're all connected, we're all one, we're all words have power, um, our blood has power, everything has power within it, um, every living thing. So um, they're really intense topics to talk about. There's all kinds of um, different philosophies based on this stuff who believe different things about it. Um, I'm not sure really what I believe about um, all of it, but I think it's really interesting to, um, to look at all these different theories. And I think it, there is something to the fact that there's 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, there's 22 um, cards of the major arcana. I think there is some connection. I think every religion has tapped into some form of trying to get in contact with the creator. Um, we all are searching. Uh, those of us who are on this spiritual quest, we're searching for that intimate bond, that intimate con connection with deity, with spirit, um, whatever different um, <clears throat> different practices and different beliefs call it different things, but somehow, you know, I think within us we're searching for that same kind of thing, that connection, that knowing that life has meaning. And so I thought I would share that. Um, I'm on my long drive today. Just, I'm just driving straight down the highway for hours all day long, basically, and then I stop for my five-minute appointment, and then I have to drive back, but, um, so I hope you guys are having a great day, and blessed be. Bye!